Okay, so we are recording. Welcome everyone. This is the webinar on confidential computing in financial services. We are a community focused on open source licensing projects, securing data in use. Every member is welcome and we are a transparent and collaborative community. Um, Bessie, I would like to hand it over to you, introduce everyone. Sure, welcome everybody. Thanks for making the time to join this webinar today on a very exciting topic um, near and dear to my heart. My name is Bessie. I'm the head of product at Kate Privacy, a confidential computing company that aims to make data security available to every single developer. Um, thanks so much to Helen for organizing from the CCC today day and all the heavy lifting that's gone in the background over the last few weeks. I want now I want each of the panelists to introduce themselves and I'm just going in um, the order that I have on the screen in front of me. So no no tricky business here. Uh, why don't you go ahead, uh, Mark, and introduce yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Mark Novak. I work for a major financial institution uh, as an enterprise security architect. Uh, I've spent many years at Microsoft. In fact, I was uh, the architect of some of Microsoft's uh, services uh, around confidential computing back in the day. And uh, I am now the uh, chair of the Confidential uh, Computing Consortium's uh, Governance, uh, Risk, and Compliance uh, Special Interest Group, uh, where we basically seek to accelerate the creation and adoption of regulations around confidential computing for all regulated industries. Thanks, Mark. Richard? Yeah, thanks, Bessie. My name's Richard Searle. I'm the Vice President of Confidential Computing at Fortanix, one of the general members at the Confidential Computing Consortium. Uh, and I'm here today as one of the general members' representatives to the governing board of the Confidential Computing Consortium and also the chair of the End User Advisory Council there. And last but not least, Gavin. Hi, everyone. I'm Gavin Uma, co founder and CTO at Key Privacy. Um, I, I'm an entrepreneur, uh, mostly. So, um, I had a startup about 10 years ago called Go Instant that was acquired by, um, Salesforce, um, spent a few years at Salesforce at, at what I call enterprise university, learning the ropes of a, of a big company, um, and then started a private social network in, uh, 2017, um, started angel vesting, um, around that time. So I've invested in about 30 startups. Um, and started Cape Privacy in 2017 with my uh, co-founders, and I've been eating, sleeping, and uh, and uh, drinking, I guess, uh, all this uh, data privacy and data security stuff uh, for a while now. Awesome. Thanks for the great context and text and all of you for joining us today. Uh, for the, those of you still joining the webinar, there's probably some people still trick, uh, trickling in. We just had all of our moder all of our panelists introduce themselves. And the topic today, as you've all signed up for, is confidential computing and financial services and what that actually means and how can that actually be applied. Um, I'm just going to make a broad assumption today. A lot of the folks who joined um, maybe have only heard of this term for the fir first time and are people in financial services or otherwise figuring out what this technology can do for their for their industries for and for their customers and for privacy and security. So um, I'd like to just go off and we can start with we can start with Mark and we'll go around the horn. Um, how would you explain confidential computing for someone who works in financial services but has never heard of it? Yeah, so uh, I would basically emphasize two things. Um, confidential computing uh, completes the trifecta of data protection. Uh, so if you go back uh, many years, uh, we, you know, you couldn't put your credit card into the web browser, or you couldn't lose your laptop. We didn't have data in transit uh, protection. We didn't have data address protection. Those things uh, became available, and they are now in uh, broad use. Uh, confidential computing also offers you data in use protection. Uh, you've already interfaced with that. Uh, if you own a video game console or a mobile phone, you already have confidential computing on a video game console that protects uh, against cheating uh, or you know rogue peripherals or piracy, and on your mobile phone that protects payments. So you could be in physical possession of the device, but there are some aspects of the computation of the device you cannot control. The other thing that, and I find this um, kind of a, it's a mindset gap. When people think about data and use protection, they think fully homomorphic encryption, they think uh, schema multi-party computation, those uh, definitely work. 
but they uh, tend to be latency heavy and they do not support commodity, uh, you know, programming languages and commodity tool chains. The key thing about confidential computing is you can continue using the code that you have. Could be Python, could be Java, could be Rust, could be Go, could be WebAssembly, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's just a question of how you package it. And so your existing developers can switch to use confidential computing uh, with effectively minimum of retraining. Now, it gets a lot more complicated from there, but that would be my elevated pitch. And Mark, that is a great elevator pitch. Um, we hear it all the time where people still think of traditional PPML, but are not thinking in count the latency and and basically being able to make everything you do portable for confidential computing. Um, Richard, you want to expand on that? Yeah, that, that's a very good point that Mark made, that the, the code that you're using is the same code that you would use in an unsecured world, but you're protecting it in memory. And the way that that's done is to deploy into what's called a trusted execution environment, of which there are various flavors based on the underlying hardware that you're using. It's now broadly available within the major cloud service providers, so it's accessible to enterprise uh, customers in banking and financial services. And one of the other important uh, conditions of that trusted execution environment is that it's subject to a process called attestation. Uh, and attestation is really the ground truth of confidential computing because it affirms that the trusted execution environment has been uh, created authenticated using the um, hardware-based uh, cryptographic identity of the hardware. Um, we might come on to talk about that. Uh, and also the integrity of the code can be verified using attestation to ensure that when you're uh, communicating with applications that are protected in memory, that it's actually the software that you expect to be using. And then obviously when the, the data that you're processing is used in that trusted execution environment, it's encrypted uh, in memory uh, and that's not accessible to uh, root users, for example. And so there is a, a separation between the trusted execution environment deployment and, for example, cloud admins or uh, other third-party software that's using the same resource. Richard, that's such a great point because I hear the question all the time. So how can we trust, how can we trust confidential computing? And how do we actually understand that that process and the attestation process is really the heart and core of confidential computing and what we're trying to accomplish here, giving transparency to folks. Gavin, I'd love to hear like your thoughts on wrapping up. Um, how would you explain confidential computing in and especially to the financial services folks that are here today, given our continued conversations in this area? I mean, a, a lot a lot of interesting um, points have been been made here, and I, th I think what Richard said um, about the integrity of the, the processing of the data um, through attestation is is very, very important. And that's um, something that people um, I think is sometimes missed when we talk about this, the idea of, um, you know, data is protected in transit, it's protected at rest, but it's not protected in use. And so you think, okay, the data is going to be protected in use. Um, and I think what is sometimes, um, I think that's a great, a great way to um, explain things um, to someone at the beginning, but I think where confidential computing starts to get really interesting is when you start thinking about the ability to encrypt data for a particular process and the ability to verify um, that that code has not been modified, right? Um, because up until, you know, trusted execution environments, we've always thought about encrypting data for a domain, right? With the, in the case of HTTPS. But once it hits that domain, you have no idea what's happening to that data, right? Um, or encrypting data for a particular res recipient with um, public key encryption. Yeah. But with confidential computing, we can really start thinking about encrypting data for a particular process. And I think that, that just changes yeah. everything. It actually, so confidential computing, I think, in architectural terms, introduces this concept of a uh, very, very strong concept of code identity. So, you know, you may have heard of a concept like a service principal name, but ultimately, uh, under confidential computing, it is the code that is given access to data. The code sees the data. So if a bank and a hospital would like to collaborate on the data set, but they don't trust each other, they don't trust each other's administrators, but maybe they trust Intel because ultimately it's a hardware rooted technology. What they can do is they can agree on the code and they can basically say this code, this and like, I don't know, artificial intelligence model uh, will see the code, will be able to produce results. And then they can basically say, here are our data sets. 
we're going to create a policy that only this code will see the joint data set and uh, we'll be able to have proof about that. Uh, you cannot lie uh, with, with this technology about what code gets access to the data. And also you cannot lie about which code produced the results, which is also important. You can basically, it's, it's protected on the way in, it's protected on the way out. And no human will see the code, not the cloud administrator, not uh, peers uh, that are trying to collaborate. So, and the possibilities from there are actually uh, quite endless. It's really a major, major paradigm flip. And I love the way that you explained it, Merck. Um, you're, you're encrypting for code and, and you have the, um, you're protecting that code. You have the integrity of the code, um, the integrity of the result because you know it was processed by that code. But what that enables, um, is massive, like just for a given example, let's say you wanted to submit your personal data for a mortgage application, right? I'm submitting my data for a mortgage application. I'm not submitting it for some other purpose, right? So if I can encrypt that data for uh, the mortgage model, right? For the approval model. And that's the only thing that the recipient can do with my data is, is process whether or not I'm approved or pre-approved for a mortgage. That's it. That's the only use they can get out of that data. And I think that's just, again, just a major paradigm flip that I think that's, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, I think we'll look back on just how trans transformative that, that paradigm flip was for the applications that we use and, and how we submit data into a system. Also, from a regulatory perspective, now we're, uh, and again, uh, my employer uh, operates in, uh, in, and is responsible probably to over 100 different regulators around the world. And, uh, you know, sometimes they want diametrically opposite things. But uh, we hear rumblings uh, from around the world where uh, regulators in uh, certain jurisdictions want to start and ask questions. Look, you're holding on to our money, right? These are not you know, movies, these are not, uh, you know, like trivial uh, pieces of data. So uh, how, how do you trust public clouds with all our money, right? And uh, under confidential computing, uh, the amount, the number of entities you need to trust shrinks dramatically. Uh, so if I say this code will only, like, will only run this, and I only trust uh, Intel and AMD processors to do this, um, then at some point in time, it becomes actually irrelevant where uh, in the world the uh, code runs, because as long as it runs on one of those processors, it's a very, very strong cryptographic guarantee that that's, in fact, what's going on. So I think once regulators wake up to the possibility uh, that confidential computing offers, uh, from there, the leap to uh, this is no longer optional for you, <laughs> go ahead and use it by default, I think is uh, uh, just a matter of time. So so the, my recommendation to regulated institutions, including my own, is the sooner you start experimenting with this technology, the better positioned you're going to be. And also because it's an emerging technology, uh, the better positioned you're going to be to provide feedback to uh, various vendors uh, around you know, how to do this so it, it works best for you. So again, this is going to be a very virtuous loop if we can get more regulated institutions on board now. Definitely, really, res really resonates in all the conversations that um, we've had and we've seen seen around. And I think several of you touched on this really good point of a paradigm shift and of this being an emerging technology. And I, you know, maybe I'm speaking for us or speaking for the entire room based on what I what I've seen is right now this is a new technology category and basically showing the value proposition to both regulators as well as the financial services industries and beyond is still something of a learning curve for folks, which is why we're all here today. Um, we very much looked at this as a, from K Privacy's point of view as something around developer security and seeing this overlap with data, data, data security. Um, maybe too limiting of a category, but I think it's a good way to help people understand how this can help, which some of you touched on, is about describing confidential computing and its role in the data security lifecycle. Um, I'll go in the reverse order this time, and I'll start with Gav. Sure, thank you. Um, you, you, yeah, you, you mentioned hey privacy, like just looking at at our approach to it, we've we've really taken um, um, the approach of of not so much about being um, lifting and shifting like existing workloads workloads into um, into confidential computing infrastructure, um, but 
using confidential computing ourselves as a solution to help developers implement their own uh, data security um, using the best practices that we've implemented. Um, and the, the way we think of one of the killer um, first use cases, you know, with any emerging technology, what's, what's the killer first use case? Um, our, our theory is that the killer first use case of confidential computing is key management, right? Um, because by introducing confidential computing, you can now extend um, um, keys for the purposes of um, um, decryption or for the purposes of um, signing um, into confidential computing infrastructure where the keys can be used, but they can remain confidential while they're in use. Um, and that enables developers to really easily um, encrypt data um, and then decrypt that data for processing without having to um, manage the keys themselves or be, or be exposed um, to the keys. So as we think about um, data security and, and confidential computing, um, we're really thinking a lot about, um, about key management and, and about democratizing things like um, you know, client-side encryption um, that are otherwise just very, very cumbersome for, for a developer to implement on their own uh, because they need expertise and not just the client-side encryption libraries, the algorithms that are being used, um, but also the key management infrastructure positioning, provisioning keys and managing key policies. And we, we see confidential computing as just taking a lot of that work um, away from the human and putting it within the trusted execution environment. Thanks, Jeff. That's definitely you know our approach at a very low level and how we're looking at this in terms of data security. I'd love to hear from Richard because you're, I looked at Fortanix and your focus um, head on is about uh, financial services and about I like this I like your slogan. You know I wish we had your copywriter data security you can bank on in this you know beautiful bold and font. I'd love to hear your perspective and how you're approaching financial institutions from from your space. Yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're synonymous with key management because that was the, the first application of the, the technology that we introduced back in 2017. So it's been around for a while. And as, as you you know, the, the Confidential Computing Consortium has called that out as a, a use case for the technology. But um, I think you made the, the point, Bessie, that, you know, this is still a nascent technology. Um, there's a lot of education still to happen. The work that Mark is doing with the, the GRC um, special interest group at the Confidential Computing consortium is extremely important to help people understand how it provides the data security that they require in banking and financial services um, and certainly you know essentially what you're trying to do is not only protect the data but also those secrets that you're using within your your applications that um, you know you, you want to keep and, and the sensitive intellectual property of things like AI algorithms that you're using to analyze the, that, that sensitive data so that the whole the whole data in use uh, protection is, is valid from a number of different aspects in terms of what uh, banking and financial services organization, organizations want to do, not only with each other and with regulatory agencies, but also internally where they operate extraterritorially and they have to restrict access to data between their different uh, divisions and operating units. I think one of the things that we see within the, the banking and financial services sector is that you know, there are uh, a number of use cases where this technology has, um, you know, sort of very immediate relevance. And certainly one of those is in things like anti-money laundering um, and financial crime uh, prevention. You know, there's huge losses to uh, financial crime. It also has an impact in things like human trafficking, anti-terrorism uh, protection. And so the ability to analyze data securely without exposing that data or breaching the the, uh, the privacy covenants that you have under different legislation is is really important. And Mark used the word in, in his last comment, which I, I sort of pick on when I, I talk to our customers and, and the industry at large, which is it's about data collaboration rather than data sharing. Because the whole point is you don't want to share the data. You want to be able to use it together and extract value from it, but without actually exposing that data um, you know, to, to a, an untrusted party. So you know, banking and financial services has a number of different use cases that it also um, you know sort of trickles down to things like know your customer just understanding those customer touch points uh, and certainly it's a, a very important vertical for adoption of the technology I think. Thanks Richard that's a great expansion and getting on to this all of use cases. 
Uh, Mark, I like how you started um, this idea of trust of basically trusting the hardware security modules and moving from a re strictly regulatory mindset. Mindset. We'd love to continue to hear some of those thoughts more in detail, especially around convincing regulators or just convincing everyone out there about how this secures your data, how this how they can be trusted by these hardware. Actually, security. I I want to um, make another point on use cases. So uh, we don't have a whiteboard here, but this is going to be simple enough. Let's visualize a two by two matrix, right? You can have code, uh, you know, uh, integrity and confidentiality. You can have data integrity and confidentiality sort of in one hand, uh, you can say, okay, I just want to keep this stuff secret. In other case, you're like, well, okay, fine. You know, I don't want it to be messed with, but uh, it, 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 you know, it, it's okay for it to be in the open. So if you do this two by two quadrant, uh, you are lucky today to be in the data is open and uh, code is open uh, sort of uh, quadrant uh, because ultimately your cloud provider uh, is uh, like basically like a, you know, I joke, if I buy electricity or water from a utility company, I don't have a representative of that company sitting in my room saying, are you waterboarding somebody? Are you electrocuting somebody? Are you growing pot plants? Like whatever, right? Um, I, I pay for consumption and that's about it. But let's talk about the use cases in the other three quadrants. So there is uh, an obvious one where, uh, fine, we agreed on the code. Everybody knows what the code is, but the data is super secret. That's the one I spoke to earlier. There is another one that is, you know, both of my code and my data are super secret. Maybe we trained the super interesting model, uh, us in this hospital, and we would like to, you know, operate on it, but we would like to be in complete secrecy. So in that case, uh, you know, if somebody really wants to know what the hell that is, they better be a law enforcement agency and they better serve a warrant on us, not on the cloud provider, because they're powerless. They can't look at it um right so uh but there is a third quadrant that is kind of exciting and that's where the code is secret but the um uh, data is public. So there it could be something like, you know, I'm executing a trading strategy. So those are secret. The fact that they operate on the market feeds, you now that's public data, right? So we're not really worried about marking feeds being like you know publicly available. But how we make decisions on them in the public cloud, that's our trade secret. We would like to protect that. So we can do that. And there is a fourth quadrant, which is also interesting, but I think it's underappreciated today. In some cases, you just care uh, about uh, in integrity of both code and data. Uh, where you have to have guarantee that this code has executed and you have to have a guarantee that it executed on given data, right? And that could, that is, falls under the, um, the category of sealed glass proofs and commitment schemes. You can do off-chain execution of smart contracts this way, right? Uh, so uh, you can look in multiple directions and get really interesting, uh, you know, uh, scenarios and they're all of interest to financial institutions, but for you know, different parts. Compare this with existing uh, techniques and you would be really, really hard pressed to deliver equivalent functionality. Definitely. And Mark, I really love the enthusiasm there for this technology that I can see shining through and really hope that, you know, for we are kind of, you know, basically a third way through. Hope everybody's now gotten this intro to the different concepts on confidential computing and some of its possibilities. I want to kind of get back into some solid examples before we shift the conversation to how your companies can adopt confidential computing and questions. So I'm going to just um, turn it back first to Richard, since I think you started to touch on this bit is mm. starting to share some very like tangible examples of where confidential computing is now in financial services that you've seen thus far. And where do you think you want it to go? Because right now, I think a lot of us have seen the obvious examples that overlap with PPML, like anti laundry monitoring, for example. But what mm. we, we're but what we still keep seeing things like data breaches every day and also lost opportunity on data you can't collaborate and process on. So we'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, where you've seen, seen confidential computing work really well today and where do you really want to see it to go in this industry yeah i mean i, I i'm pretty ambitious about its its scope in uh you know financial services and as you said there are some fairly straightforward use cases like uh, the crime prevention examples that i mentioned and the know your customer examples where you're, you're looking to basically uh, extract value from larger data sets maybe train models with uh, increased sample sizes than you would have within your own institution uh, and certainly we see interest in that from uh, different regulators uh, across the globe but Equally, the, the decentralized finance uh, 
and uh, blockchain space still remains very relevant for confidential computing. And, you know, we, we've used the technology, for example, to provide um, sealed warm wallets where there is control for the customer because of the, uh, the preservation of those keys within confidential computing, trusted execution environments to prevent attackers from using them and to ensure that, you know, the key is secured properly. Uh, that's very relevant in terms of preventing some of the losses that we've seen within the, the cryptocurrency industry. Um, and whilst it's going obviously through a, 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 what's been called the, the crypto winter at the moment, it, it will resurface, there's no doubt about that. And, and that leads me on to some of the sort of future use cases that we might want to look at. And certainly, you know, I see a couple there. The first would be, you know, where we have central banks introducing stable coins and central bank digital currencies. I see an important role for confidential computing as part of the underlying fabric that's required in order to enable uh, those types of um, implementations uh, across not only uh, different banking and financial services institutions but also between individual governments as well where you know data doesn't necessarily want to be exposed and I think that, you know, I come back again to the work that Mark is doing, engaging with those regulatory agencies so they see the potential for the technology and they understand its scope is very important. But the other area that I see is actually where um, banking and financial services, rather than working in a sort of siloed um, domain where, you know, we're just looking at financial data and focused on the operation of the banks, can actually integrate that data with other areas, such as in healthcare, for example, where, you know, there are um, uh, benefits to be gained between those two different industries by virtue of the information that's available on uh, things like, um, you know, poverty uh, within different populations, uh, and also ensuring fair access to things like uh, Medicare and things like that. So uh, I think this is an important technology to enable some of those business innovations, like I said, and um, rather than just addressing it as a, a security technology, I, I think that that enablement is going to be important in encouraging those early adopters and, and fast followers. Richard, really love that word enablement because I think that's really what we're all trying to do here because there's always a delicate balance when we've been having these conversations of the world is scary and there's a lot of security threats, but also when we have, at least on our end, when I have these conversations with people, people almost lose the point. Well, what about all these like great things you can do, such as the collaborative use cases that, you know, we worked on, we worked on at CAPE and also in general, where right now it's too scary of a topic, but we can actually move forward and have a lot of progress on this. So that's great. Um, Gavin, we'd love you to expand on that since we've seen some of this ourselves in terms of not just protection at the low level, but also letting people actually do what they really want to do and expand on business value and value to the, just people in general. Yeah, I'm very excited about applications of machine learning um, with confidential computing. I think naturally machine learning models require a lot of data. And when you're talking about sensitive data, sensitive data is often um, the highest value, right? Um, it's, it's the data that we're the most reluctant to put into a model, but it's the data that we really want to put into the model <laughs> just from a pure utility perspective, right? You see examples of this with um, OpenAI and GPT-3, right? Um, there's already been examples of somebody's working at a large company and they're using GPT-3 and they hook it into their spreadsheet and, oh, guess what? That's proprietary financial data that you shouldn't have put into that model. And guess what? That, that data could be retrained on the model and somebody could extract that data out of the model later or somebody who's internal to OpenAI could get access to that plain text data, will have access to that plain text data. Um, and I think that that's where you start to see really interesting applications um, where, you know, your employee um, was trying to do the, the right thing. They were, they were trying to use machine learning to assist them in their work, right? Um, but unless you're considering the data privacy and data security implications of that, it's, it's just not responsible. Um, and so how can we enable people to take advantage of advanced um, machine learning models um, where, as, as, as Mark pointed out, you know, in this case, OpenAI is trying to keep that model confidential, right? So you can't just take that model and, and run it on your side, right? You can't, just, you can't just run it on your device. That model's in the cloud. It's in OpenAI's infrastructure, and they're, and they're trying to keep that model, um, they're trying to keep that model confidential. 
What they're not able to do right now is to keep your data inputs. When you're prompting that model, they're not able to keep those prompts confidential, right? And so if you can marry those two things where, you know, an end user, right, is able to keep their inputs confidential and even their outputs confidential, right? So I can ask the model a question and get an answer back, but the model doesn't know what I asked or what answer it gave me, right? Um, and I don't get any access to the actual model itself. That can, that can be proprietary. That's where I think you start to see really interesting uh, new business models emerge. And we start to become a lot more comfortable with using machine learning on very sensitive data, as Richard pointed out, healthcare data, you know, genetic data, um, combining data sets across companies, maybe a genetic data sets combined with a financial data set in some way, you know, um, but you can start to do those things comfortably because the, you know, the various parties that are inputting data into the system and even the model owner can all maintain the um, proprietary of their inputs. Great. New business models is definitely where we want to go, where we want to go here with this technology, protecting data and, and enablement. Uh, Mark, I think you clearly had a lot of thought on this as well. Would love to hear about where you've seen, seen things go well and where you want to see things go. Well, so I wrote an article in LinkedIn uh, that uh, was uh, entitled uh, Towards the Broad Adoption of Confidential Computing. And in that article, uh, which I can, you can find it on LinkedIn, I just gave you the title, but uh, it lists uh, three uh, categories of barriers to adoption. Um, there, none of them are insurmountable. Uh, they will uh, take a little bit of time. Uh, and uh, I will say this, there has been a breakthrough year. I've been in this technology for the better part of 15 years. And uh, when I first uh, told people uh, back at Microsoft uh, that we will live in a world where we will be operating data centers, where we're not in the trusted computing base of our customers, they looked at me like I was unwell. Well, I was okay <laughs> but it took uh it, like literally it was in the last year or two uh that we're now having offerings from intel from arm from uh md uh there are groups in uh the pci uh working group uh that is doing uh, making sure that the buses are protected uh you know the nvidia just released the very uh, exciting confidential uh, GPUs. So the building blocks are falling into place. Uh, it's still going to take, by my estimation, the you know low to mid uh, single digit number of years for really broad adoption. Uh, now, uh, for a number of scenarios, I believe you can start experimenting with this and in fact, putting production workloads today we are now at that level of maturity. Uh, it's going to be a little painful. So a little, again, a little throwback. I was uh, an intern at IBM, uh, you know, in the early 90s. And they gave me this computer, this big, big thing uh, with a CRT tube and all. Uh, and I couldn't use it for the first couple of days because somebody from the quote unquote communications manager team needed to come in and configure a myriad of different things for the thing to be able to connect. Today, uh, you bring a computer home and you're up within a couple of clicks. So there is a, you know, a level of standardization that uh, will happen. There is a level of usability improvement that will happen. We'll learn how to operationalize it and put correct policies around it. So that's all coming. Uh, and again, my, my high order bit message to folks is uh, if you experiment with it early, you will be better positioned to adopt it when the absolutely certain, 100% certainty, this is going to be a regulatory requirement, 100%. Much like you'll be required to protect data in transit, protect data trust, you'll be required to protect data in use. It'll get easier. But uh, the sooner you start experimenting, the sooner you can start talking to folks in the industry, the cloud service providers, the ISVs, uh, the hardware vendors uh, around how to make this work better for you. That's a great segue into the next into the next topic, which is about how do we get more adoption of this technology. Um, first, I want to give a quick call out. So I saw some questions coming in the Q and A already. So feel free to type those in, and we'll get to those very very shortly. Just want to remind folks that that is there. But Mark, you made a really good point about how 
this will definitely be something regulated and early movers will have a big advantage here. But wanted to hear from all of you and you know, we're, all, we're, all, we're all people who are huge advocates of this technology, but coming back down to earth after hearing all these great things are, what do you all think are some of the barriers to adoption right now? And how can we especially collaborate better with the hardware companies to celebrate the adoption development? Because um, I think as all of us, the, panelists and Helen know in this room, working with this technology right now, it's not the easiest thing when things happen at a very low level. So what can we do to help break these barriers around adoption and how can we collaborate with our partners in terms of the hardware, the cloud providers, and just so that we can bring this to industry faster, especially to a space as regulated and as difficult, difficult to navigate as financial services. And Mark, since you started along this train, um, I'll pass it back to you first. Well, so this is where I'm going to put my, uh, you know, pessimist hat on just for a minute. Uh, confidential computing in its DNA is a single device technology. Uh, so on your mobile phone, it will do something. On your video game console, it will do something for you. But those are tightly integrated single purpose devices. No cloud application is monolithic and uh, no in the future, no device is going to be confidential monolithic. So uh, we will need to solve the problem. And this is not for our customers to solve. This is for vendors to solve uh, of how to think about confidential cloud applications uh, that are composed of multiple things. Like today, go ask, what's confidential serverless look like? I don't think there is a good answer. Um, and each individual device involved in this compound cloud application consists of confidential CPU confid from one vendor, confidential GPU from another vendor, confidential network interface card from yet another vendor. Those are still on the drawing board. Um, and that is probably one of the uh, you know, biggest technological barriers that, uh, in fact, I think I'm just hoping that customers will come to the board and say, you know, we find this technology uh, amazing, solve this problem for us, beat the table. Um, the other comment I make, which uh, that one is a little bit more controversial depending on who uh, you ask. Uh, I, my, so my joke is we have two classes of customers in confidential computing, the paranoid and the regulated. And the paranoid have no money. The tinfoil hat brigade, not, that's not where anybody makes any money. Uh, but uh, the regulated ones, uh, they are the ones with budgets and they're the ones who have, I know, because I'm in the trenches, so many different problems to fix today related to everything down to mainframes. Um, what compels the use of confidential computing? Well, there could be some scenarios like collaborating between institutions um, or uh, there could be, you know, uh, so, something else that you need to do until regulators come in and say you have to do this for us you have to protect your data and use uh the, the regulator institutions may not move as fast as uh, many would like i love that the parent the paranoid and the regulated um hopefully hopefully we'll try to be a little bit less pessimistic but your point is very well made in terms of how we see in privacy um i think gavin and i have been trying to spend all day on trying to figure out if what's the liminal space between the paranoid and regu regulated and you know would love to gavin would love to hear you talk a bit about um, where you see the barriers to adoption and you know what we're trying to do and who we should work with to get this technology more off the ground in our approach yeah, I mean, I think it's it's still just really um, difficult to use um, confidential computing technologies, um, you know, and then there's there's multi cloud considerations as well. OK, you did a lot of work. You can use it in one cloud, but can you use it in another cloud? And I think there's a lot of awesome efforts from the community to, you know, work to provide an interface that kind of abstracts you away from like the underlying um, confidential computing infrastructure so that you can just have an application and then you can de deploy it to Azure, GCP, uh, AWS, um, and, and it'll just work and it will handle the kind of attestation handshakes and, and differences between um, those various uh, cloud providers. So I, I, I see a lot of, I see enough happening there that it's, it, it's kind of like you can extrapolate it to being like a solved problem enough down the road. Like there's enough people that see that problem and, and they're working on it. Um, the regulation um, point that Mark brings up is is super interesting, and I love Mark's optimism that it that there will be a regulation that mandates confidential computing in in certain industries. Um, I love that. That that's super interesting. 
Um, and, and I also subscribe to the ideas um, in, in Mark's blog post um, that regulation will be the thing that like really skyrockets um, confidential computing. It's when you have to do it, you know? Um, and today I, th I think we're often finding, you know, customers that really truly care about, about data security, you know, like they beyond what regulation requires them to do. They really care about um, data security. And so they're willing to, to, to be, you know, the innovators and the early adopters. Um, but I think we'll really hit the, um, the inflection point when, when there's a regulation that says, Hey, if, if you're going to be processing genetic data, health data, um, financial data, um, you know, et cetera, within the government, um, um, you're, you're going to, to need to use confidential computing that meets these standards. And I think that will be super interesting. And I think that will be, um, I think that will be something that really enables us to start taking um, advantage of, again, more just more sensitive data that's higher value um, and having a lot more trust in the systems that we're using. If we know that, hey, this given application um, meets um, this compliance standard, that you know, they, um, they, they meet that compliance standard for confidential computing, and therefore I'm comfortable uploading my genetic data into this application. I think that would be a really great thing for, for the consumer as well. I might chime in with another thing there. We're talking about existing scenarios. I also believe that uh, this technology uh, is going to uh, create a new business, uh, like business that you cannot have today. So I will imagine for a second that a financial institution would like to underwrite an insurance policy in the country of Albania, which we've all heard about, that has uh, really, really poor governance. We cannot trust the courts. We cannot trust the regulators there. But what we can do is uh, we can deploy uh, devices uh, around uh, measuring humidity, rainfall, temperature, uh, you know, wind, whatever. Uh, like, and the confidential computing allows you, at, at its core, to create devices that are temper-proof. Right, you can know you can successfully manage it. It cannot lie about what it's doing, right? So now we went and made these bunch of devices. Now think about confidential IoT land. We deploy them in the fields around Albania, and when these devices uh, register certain conditions, they can trigger an execution of a smart contract. All of a sudden, we now have an ability to enter a line of business that we could never enter before. And uh, this is going to be a revenue generator. Again, this is where, um, you know, uh, thinking about these uh, new capabilities creatively uh, and thinking about them early can give you a competitive edge. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point that Mark makes. And, I, you know, I, I subscribe to the view that, that you know, has been set out already that this is going to be a ubiquitous technology. Uh, we're, we're verging on that now. And, and it's going to be a necessary technology based on uh, regulatory uh, oversight. But be between that gap of necessity and capability, we've got to demonstrate that it's actually um, deployable and reliable. And that requires things like interoperability between the various flavors of, of trusted execution environment that we spoke about. It requires seamless uh, deployment capability so that the security is abstracted away from the uh, the users of the technology, you know, within the business units of the, the financial services companies. But I, I think actually that while we might be, you know, on a journey as far as encouraging regulators, I think I think there is light at the end of the tunnel. So we've been working, you know, extensively in healthcare um, with confidential computing. And one of the um, sort of lighthouse uh, projects there has been the Beekeeper AI project, which is using uh, healthcare data that is subject to the HIPAA security and privacy rules in the United States. And they're also protecting the intellectual property of AI developers in the healthcare domain who need to validate those models against that healthcare data. And actually, because that data is regulated and it is being demonstrated to be a, a secure system to provide that service, it's encouraging other people to look at the opportunities there actually within the regulatory bodies themselves. And I, I also think that Mark's point about the uh, the new business models that we don't yet 
understand, we, we can't anticipate is very relevant, particularly as we're moving into this era of huge AI systems and uh, integration of AI within uh, business processes more widely. Uh, and I think that offers some, some hope for the adoption of confidential computing, because I think where there are some uh, early adopters that actually uh, gain competitive advantage by using data securely uh, to generate new services for their customers. We might think, for example, of applications in personalized finance where an AI system could actually uh, set up relationships between uh, one bank customer as the lender uh, against um, a loan or some credit agreement for another customer based on compatibility. And, and as Mark's mentioned, you know, risk management is also an important area where there are gains to be made for financial institutions. I think once other financial institutions see that market trend, that will sort of encourage them to follow in behind. And I, I think that's something that we can look forward to as, as AI is one particular area where the technology is being applied. Definitely, definitely. and really great point. And really like that we've gone from the minute to looking beyond at a larger vision and not just not just regulation, not just technology. So I want to wrap up kind of the, you know, this panel part of the question with each of you, which is really this like final parting question before we go to the audience, which is we had where the CCC had this webinar because and webinar, and I think everyone in the room room thinks that more people should know about confidential computing because so many times when we talk to people, you, um, I think Mark, you raised the point earlier, people are thinking of homomorphic encryption. When we talk about security, people are using terms like zero trust. So I would love to you know, leave the last thought with each of, each of you is um, how can we talk about confidential computing so that people will know more about this topic because it definitely feels like there's a lack of education on it and how do we promote this as a, techn as a technology and for the future. So um, I'll, I'll start back up with Mark, Gab and Richard for the last word and then we'll open it up to the audience. Yeah, so I'll go back to this. If you knew with absolute certainty that uh, you will be required to adopt a technology, uh, which is the stick, but the carrot is you can use your existing tool chains, you can use your uh, you know, existing, you don't need to retrain your developers. Uh, it covers all existing uh, computing scenarios, AI, ML, uh, cloud, uh, IoT, whatever, um, you know, why wouldn't you go and explore this? And uh, you're faced with a mind gap. People will think fully homomorphic encryption. And this is literally not what this is. This is a hardware assisted technology where you need to trust commodity and commodity hardware. And yeah, how would, how would you sum up how to basically fill this thought gap? I mean, For I, I, I always I always think about the consumer and when, when you see these just sort of like inflection points, um, um, you know, the TLS or HTTPS was was mentioned um, earlier and that 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 went through this kind of trajectory where, hey, it's an interesting technology, but it's really hard to use, right? Like you need these experts that can just like add um, um, you know SSL at the time to to your website. It's really really cumbersome. It's difficult to use. And guess what? It's going to slow down your workloads, right? Like so, it's going to be more expensive to process requests. And but but the question you know that I think is always interesting is like, what are people not doing today, right? Because we don't have ubiquitous confidential computing, right? Um, so at the time, it was online banking, online payments. We just weren't doing those online. I'm old enough to remember just being absolutely terrified of the idea of doing like online banking. It just, and I remember my parents' reaction to the to the concept of online banking. You know, like um, obviously we all do it today. You know, um, but it was because of HTTPS and the little green lock in the browser and just that, just how that hit the you know consumer zeitgeist, right? Um, so I think about that with confidential computing. What will be the what is the thing that we're not doing today? you know, um, that we will be comfortable doing as a result of confidential computing that that will just capture the kind of consumer, uh, the consumer mindshare. 
Oh, and I think what we're not doing right now is such a key point in terms of looking at the future optimistically. Um, Richard, I think you also started talking about this in terms of these large AI models and thinking of the possibilities of the future. So um, why don't you bring us home in terms of how we can get people more excited about confidential computing before we get to the questions? Yeah, well, I mean, the Confidential Computing Consortium was formed in 2019 to promote the technology and to promote the adoption. And I think, you know, we're now at a point where, um, whilst it's still a new technology, it's reaching a point of maturity in terms of its availability and in terms of the use cases that have been delivered with it by the, uh, not only the members of the Confidential Com Computing Consortium, but others, where there are stories that will resonate with uh, those that are going to be adopting it in the future. And to encourage them, as Mark said, to experiment with the technology, to deploy the technology, to test specific use cases. Uh, and there are now sort of reference uh, adopters uh, within the marketplace that, that can be used to, to, to advocate for it. I think one of the important things is that, you know, the, the Confidential Computing Consortium is also, you know, looking in its outreach activity and its end user advisory uh, activity at the venues where we can promote that, not just in the open source community, which is important to that to our projects, but also at industry events. And you know, there's a going to be some major events on the calendar this year where the community of confidential computing consortium members can come together and not just preach to the converted like you and I, where you know we we want to you know talk about the technology, we know it, we understand it, and we see the the opportunities. But to the financial services organizations and the healthcare organizations and the government agencies and the regulators that need to understand it and think about how this fits within, you know, what they're trying to achieve. And I, I'm really excited about that prospect this year. And if we get more of those user stories out in the public domain, um, get the analysts, you know, thinking about them and get coverage in the press. And we're seeing that now with, um, you know, just external interest. Um, based on you know the the um, motivations to adopt privacy enhancing technology across different government jurisdictions uh, that 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 will sort of lead to a cascade i feel and uh, you know the, there's plenty to talk about i think we're all really excited for that cascade i love that term the the convert that we can we can bring that up next time we have one of the ccc meeting meeting that's an awesome term so um first i got a question got some answered questions so thank you on that detail oriented answer richard but we have something a little more general here so from caleb um what are the main innovations that have contributed to the enablement of confidential computing in the past five years or is this primarily enabled through collaboration among vendors across the hardware software network stack and we can we can go around the horn here. So Gav, I don't know if you wanted to take a crack at this one first. Yeah, I mean, it, it was mentioned towards the, the beginning of the call, but just in terms of the primitives, I really I really think of, um, of attestation um, as a primitive rooted in some sort of, you know, hardware security module or some sort of hardware um, chip that's kind of like holding on to the, the key. Um, the, and and then when you start to think of attestation as just a primitive um, in your applications, you can start to think of this kind of future of 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 computing. Um, we imagine a cloud where you know every single server in your cloud would have mutual attestation between every other server, right? So we talk about like some things like mutual um, TLS now, right? When we talk about zero trust, we talk about mutual TLS. But really, we should have mutual attestation between every single node, every single um, server in, in um, infrastructure or within a pipeline, um, or even across companies, right? Um, so I think of it that way. Um, we'd love to hear the others. Yeah, I mean, I think that, sorry, Mark. Yeah, I think that one of the principal um, innovations that we've seen, or not an innovation, but um, a, a, a change that is enabling confidential computing more broadly is the adoption by the cloud, particularly by hyperscale cloud providers. And people have been, you know, looking at uh, a cloud migration journey uh, in terms of the operational efficiency that that provides. Um, while it's been uh, traditionally fairly difficult and complex to deploy confidential computing on, a, on bare metal environments, 
um, that can be done, but the the advantages that the cloud providers now provide to to people that are using the technology is the ability to implement virtual machines and to uh, get up and running very quickly. As Mark mentioned, you know, with the sort of laptop analogy, this needs to be a seamless interaction with the underlying hardware, and that's now being seen as you know part of the everyday business of organisations because you know the availability across different regions and different machine sizes is there to support their workload so i think the ne the next step ahead actually is that standardization and interoperability that um you know that has been worked on elsewhere within the confidential computing consortium so that not only uh, can you deploy uh, your workloads on you know your preferred cloud provider but if you have a, a multi-cloud environment you can operate within that and you can interact with other resources um, in terms of that data collaboration using common standards uh, particularly around attestation and there's a, a project at the ccc to look at that specifically and i i think that's a very important project for the industry moving forward I would say, you know, it's a very direct uh, answer to the question of like what ha happened in the last uh, five years. Two things. The first one is that we now have confidential virtual machines. I've coded uh, things uh, for enclaves when I worked at Microsoft. It is a giant pain in the ass and only the most sophisticated developers can do that well. Uh, it's not, I mean, and I know for Tanix uh, folks, you, you know, you, you make uh, running things inside enclaves easier, but if I need to implement specifically something to just like an in the, in the SGX enclave, I have to be an expert developer. I have to be like 10 out of 10 Einstein level developer. For virtual machines, it's a larger attack surface, but I can literally take existing code and just go deploy it. And also, that will enable confidential containers, and that's how you get your interoperability, right? So that's the first like major development, and that's AMD SCV, uh, SNP from AMD, and the TDX from Intel that was just announced, and CCA from ARM. All of them play in that space. And the second one that's major is the introduction of a confidential GPU from NVIDIA, and that happened very recently in the last year. And that is what enables your confidential you know, big data AI ML processing. And we're not done. There is more stuff coming, uh, you know, you, you can bet on that. There's like the entire cloud industry is now betting on this. By the way, the, uh, the interest of all parties align around confidential computing. And this is from just pure business perspective. This is how I know it's coming because cloud vendors don't want to look inside your code. They do not want to be compelled by regulators to look inside your code. They want to wash their hands off ability to look inside your code. It's bad for business. The cloud breach is like what you at Microsoft used to call turn your badge in event. We're all going home. Nobody wants to buy our stuff anymore, right? So you want to eliminate yourself from the customer's TCB. Uh, the customers don't want to trust the cloud provider. They also want to shrink the TCB. I don't want a representative from a utility company in my living room, right? So that's uh, over there. Uh, so uh, because the interests of all parties here are aligned, and of course, vendors want to make money. <laughs> they want to sell uh, solutions into the space, right? So um, as, as a result, I, it, it benefits everyone. It's rapidly advancing. And uh, you know, this is why if we were uh, to look back at this conversation five to 10 years from now, it would be like a DAO. Of course, like, you know, of course it's happening. Mark, I hope this conversation is not duh in five <laughs> to 10 years, but duh, like a month from now. But I'm really glad that you're so excited about this and look at it so optimistic. And you're totally right. The way we look at this is the part, everything aligns, businesses, the vendors, the regulators, and also at the end of the day, the consumers and anyone who has data on the internet or in a database somewhere, which is everybody, everyone's interests aligns. And I hope for everybody who's joining us today, um, really, see, really sees that and gets excited about this technology. Um, I think we have time for one more question if someone wants to sneak something in. Well, I think uh, one of the questions that I see is about, you know, bare metal servers for yeah. Web3 applications. And, and the reality is there are now a number of large and small cloud providers offering bare metal machines with confidential computing capability. So as, as Mark said, you know, you need to think carefully about you know how simple it will be to deploy those machines but that they are broadly available now and that there's lots of uh, uh, opportunity in the marketplace to use this technology in practice now definitely and this is definitely fun. off the drawing board you can you can buy a requisite hardware and rent it from a cloud provider today in azure in aws and google 
uh, different capabilities, and, but yeah. Yeah, a lot of us are tired, also just tired loosely trying to make it easier for everyone to use democratize that technology as, as well. Just a shout out to what we're doing here at Cape. Cape. All right, we're on the last minute. So going once, going twice. All right, looks like we had a great time today here. I hope everybody learned a lot, both in terms of deep details, as well as the strategic and visionary future for where we wanna see this technology go. I really wanna say thank you to everyone who um, joined us today. So um, Richard and Mark, thank you so much for um, joining the CCCC party, so to speak. Thank you so much, Helen, for setting this up and all the staff um, working, you know, I think working with as well, as well as to our DevRel lead, um, Emily. I don't think she's online right, right now, but also thanks to her for helping coordinate and everybody at their respective organizations um, to put this together. Really appreciate the time and really hope everyone um, got a lot out of this conversation. Um, Helen, I'll hand it over to you for any um, last words from your sides, or we can uh, get going through the rest of our day. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. This webinar will be available on demand on YouTube. So stay tuned. Have a Check great it out day, on YouTube everyone. again. Send it to all your yeah. send it to all of your privacy security minded friends. Yeah. All right, great. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks again for joining and to all the all everyone who spoke. And we'll see you in confidential computing land. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. My pleasure. Bye-bye.